of the past. I've never been much of a castle lover. As a child, though, my family and I visited them by the dozens. Always the same large chilly rooms with extensive collections of paintings and antique furniture. Opulent crystal chandeliers, stone floors. From the outside, they look like souvenir postcards. My parents, unlike me, adored these ancient remnants of yesteryear and always made a point of choosing the longest guided tour. As an adult, after my ex girlfriend literally forced me to visit two chateaux and three castles in the space of six years, I insisted we take the shortest tour. No ifs, ands, or buts. The whole time the tour guide delivered her boring spiel, I was looking forward to a frosty beer with the same excitement I had looking forward to an ice cream cone when I was a little boy. Never in my life would I have dreamed I'd end up a Castellian. Now I'm a 30 year old bachelor. Who just got dumped by the bitch I lived together with for six years planning our future? Pardon me for talking that way about my ex, but what else can you call a person who cheats on you for six months straight without demonstrating even the slightest shame or remorse? But enough about her. To write even one more word about that simple minded, castle loving scum would just be a waste of paper. Our breakup threw my life for a loop, like a croupier shakes a pair of dice and throws them across the table. I've liked reading books ever since my school years and have always wanted to write one. But between my relationship and paying off the mortgage, I didn't have any time to make my dream come true. Now I'm not in a relationship, and I don't have a mortgage anymore either since I sold the flat. When I found out everything that had happened there behind my back, I couldn't bear to stay. With the money I saved, I lived in a rooming house for a while until one day I came across a want ad for a Castellian at Pernstein, a Gothic castle from the 13th century. Head filled with fantasies of long evenings of undisturbed work on my 500 page novel, I answered the ad. And to my surprise, I got it. They gave me a small house attached to the castle's northern wall. I don't own a car, so if I want to get to Nedvidice, the nearest town, the only way is to walk down a forest path half a mile, then walk back up again. High season is over now, so my main job will be maintenance of the castle's surroundings and interiors. I also have to learn the guided tours and castle history and familiarize myself with the budget. Today, I went on a walk through the entire castle with a historian from the town office and the former Castellian, who had decided to retire. I got a set of keys, signed a stack of official papers, and moved in. I still can't believe I live in a castle. My home consists of two large rooms with vaulted ceilings, a front hall, kitchen, and bathroom. My first night, I stepped out into the courtyard with a cup of hot tea and took in the majestic castle, proudly turned to the darkening sky where the stars lit up one by one. I don't consider myself a scaredy cat, but my whole life I've lived in flats. Who knows what fears of mine will be uncovered living here in this deserted place with God only knows what history? I went back inside and locked the front door just to be sure. Lying in bed, staring up at the ceiling, I heard suspicious sounds. Not once, but twice, I got up to check on the castle tower's dark silhouette, almost expecting a white shadow to flit by one of the windows. The former castellan hadn't mentioned any ghosts, so the thought of that finally lulled me back to sleep. Next morning, I peered out the window into the sunny courtyard. It was covered in a layer of dazzling yellow maple leaves. No matter how much I hate castles, 
taking in the sights of Pernstein with that radiant golden carpet, my heart gave a little flutter. I went into the bathroom and squeezed some toothpaste onto my brush. As I lifted my head and looked in the mirror, the blood froze in my veins. A young girl stood behind me, motionless, with bright green eyes staring right at me. Her cheeks were like peaches, lips full but unsmiling. Light brown curly hair flowing down the back of her cream white dress. Around her neck hung a gold chain with a green stone, presumably an emerald. Instinctively I screamed and jumped away towards the wall. I sank to the ground and covered my face with my hands, hiding behind the towels. But when I took my hands away and looked around the room, there was nobody there. Sitting there on the cold tiles, I wondered, was I hallucinating or had I really just seen a ghost? I quickly finished my morning hygiene and got out of the bathroom. I moved into the kitchen and sat down to breakfast. As I crunched my toast with salami, I glanced at my laptop out of the corner of my eye. Maybe I should start writing. Instead, I grabbed the set of keys and set out on my first tour of the castle. It was a totally different tour than the one the day before with the historian and the castellan. Now I was here all alone. When I inserted my CV and cover letter into the oblong white envelope, I had been looking forward to lounging about and sullenly on the rare period settees and four-poster beds that are cordoned off from ordinary visitors by a protective rope. But I didn't do it because, because I wasn't here alone. Dozens of waxy faces, imprisoned in heavy gilded frames, stared down at me. No matter which way I turned, the inanimate eyes of the noblemen and noblewomen followed. It reminded me too much of the bright green eyes of the girl in the bathroom and that emerald necklace of hers. So, instead, I went back to my house and turned on my laptop. No Wi-Fi networks in range. I sighed and opened a Word document to begin writing. For about twenty minutes, I sat frowning at the blinking cursor. Finally, I gave up on my first literary attempt and headed into town. Nedvidjice was a quiet little town of about a thousand people, hemmed in on all sides by forested hills. A road ran through the small town square occupied by a cafe and, almost unheard of in this day and age of supermarkets, a self-service grocery. Most of the people out strolling about were retirees. Still, there were a few attractive young women among them. For the first time since my breakup, I felt my bitterness lift and considered an attempt at contact with the opposite sex. Toward evening, I scrambled back up the path to the castle and immediately my worries returned. What if the incident from this morning happens again? I stepped hesitantly into the bathroom, picked up the tube of toothpaste, and it happened. Again, the girl's face appeared in the mirror behind me. I quickly wheeled around, but there was no one behind my back. My teeth started to chatter and my hands trembled with chills. I stumbled out of the bathroom and collapsed onto the couch. Over and over my mind kept replaying the terrifying scene. Now I was sure it was no hallucination. The girl was there, standing about a foot and a half behind me. She had light brown curly hair and green eyes, in a cream white dress with an emerald around her neck. That night I couldn't sleep. I was afraid that as soon as I closed my eyes, the girl would appear by my bed. Finally, I hid my head under the pillow. Now I understood ostriches. The false sense of security helped me get to sleep. The next day, the historian from the town office paid a visit. He brought me all the invoices and copies of financial documents from the past 20 years. Where did the castellan move to? I asked as we sat down to coffee. Jake, he and his wife bought a house in Lidice Sazovo, down by the river. 
He said he wanted to spend his retirement fishing. He couldn't have done much of that up on this rock, I said. The historian smiled. That's for sure. Only water here is when it rains. He finished his cup of coffee and glanced at his watch. I knew this was my last chance. Did he ever say anything about the castle being haunted? The historian gave me a searching look. No, why? Did you see a ghost? No, I said, lowering my eyes. If you're interested in local legends about the castle, try the town library. They've got a book there about Pernstein. He took a notepad out of his pocket and wrote down the title. What else are you doing while you're here? I'd like to write a book, I said. He looked both surprised and impressed. Really? What about? I don't know yet. I recently went through a pretty ugly breakup. I thought I might try to get it out of my system by writing. Unhappy love. Mmm, castles full of that, he said. A few moments of silence passed between us. Maybe a new girl would give you inspiration, the historian suggested. Maybe, I said. Anyway, I should be going, he said. I stood up with him. Buy a car, he suggested. It's a long walk into town. As for this business about ghosts, I hope you're not afraid, are you? Oh no, not at all, I said, and closed the door behind him. Another night went by, number three. In the morning, I sat down to my computer, but once again I couldn't squeeze out a single sentence. Not even a word. You want to write about your ex? Pfft, what's the point of stirring up all that crap? I thought about it for a moment. Isn't that what all writers do? Aren't they basically just plumbers of life, trying to unclog the backed-up toilets of their subconscious? I slapped my laptop shut in disgust. Then I looked under the table and realised I had the same socks on as yesterday. That was scary. I didn't want to end up a lazy old man with no solid routine or discipline, who can hardly manage to change his underwear every day. It was clear only one thing could save me. So seriously, you're the manager of Pernstein Castle, said Veronica, a 25-year-old brunette. I met her on the way to the cafe in Nedvidice when I stopped her to ask if she knew where I could get a coffee. I am since three days ago. She paused to stare thoughtfully at the dollop of whipped cream slowly sinking into her cup of eggnog latte. What made you decide to do that? I wanted a quiet place for writing. What are you going to write? A book. Oh yeah, what about? I'm thinking horror stories. She burst out laughing. Horror stories, for real. Well, I am living in a castle, I said. I looked at Veronica, trying desperately not to show my desire. She wasn't at all like my ex. On the surface, a sweet-faced blonde, underneath, an unfaithful bitch. Have you ever been on a tour? I asked casually. Once when I was little, but I wasn't into it. I don't get why people make such a fuss about it. The total exact opposite. Maybe you should try again. I could show you the parts that are off limits to regular visitors. She gave me an amused look, as if she'd been expecting the question from the moment I ran into her, as if she knew the real reason why I had stopped her on the street. Are you saying you're afraid to go on your own? Oh, I'm afraid all right, I said not too convincingly. Of what? Ghosts? The spectral face of the sad girl surfaced in my mind, her green eyes and pleading expression. I took Veronica's hand and declared in a very serious voice, Yes, I'm afraid of ghosts. Ludmilla was interrupted by the sound of a knock. She lifted her head from her embroidery and glanced toward the heavy oaken door. Come in, she said. A strapping knight entered the room. 
My lady, he said, bowing, may I have a word with you? Yes, Ludmilla consented. She stuck the needle in the fabric and laid it on the bed. You acted distant toward me at dinner this evening. I do not recall, Ludmilla replied. Indeed, said the knight. You paid me no attention and went straight to your room afterward. My apologies, I did not feel well. Perhaps you should leave. It is late. The knight stood gazing upon her, gripping the thick leather belt around his waist so tightly his knuckles turned white. He had come to Bernstein seeking the hand of the fetching Ludmilla and had spent three days feeling unwanted. Not for a lack of hospitality on the part of Ludmilla's parents, but rather because of their daughter's coolness. The young noblewoman, sole heiress of the castle, showed not the slightest sympathy toward him. It was insulting to the knight, but he kept control of himself. He was like a dog, waiting patiently for a bone to be dropped from an outstretched hand. For three days now, it had yet to drop. The knight's repressed emotions were awakening inside him. I would like to speak to you about us. Then speak, Ludmella said with an air of composure. She raked a hand through her wavy brown hair and smiled at the knight. She did not find him the least bit attractive. He was coarse and abrasive, and whenever he came near, he smelled of the overripe cheeses on which he had gorged himself throughout his stay. I came to ask for your hand in marriage. Your parents have given consent. In fact, they wish it very much. You could hardly find a richer and more suitable husband and it would strengthen your position among. You need not worry about our position among the Czech nobility. We have no need of a patron. We are quite well provided for, as you know. Yes, yes, indeed, said the knight with a covetous glint in his eyes. I should like to ask how long you mean to delay before you marry me. I have no intention of marrying you, replied Ludmilla, reaching for her embroidery. You should go now. The knight released his grip on his belt and stepped towards Ludmilla, then grabbed a handful of her hair and yanked it with all his might. I'm telling you now you will marry me. Either you treat me better tomorrow or I will kill you. Do you understand? He yanked her hair even harder until Ludmilla's green eyes filled with tears. Do you understand? Ludmilla stared at him terrified. The intense aroma of cheese assaulted her nostrils, making her stomach churn. The pain was unbearable. Summoning all her strength, she squeaked in a tiny voice, I understand. I returned home to the castle. The sky was cool and sprinkled with stars. A few clouds overlapped the black outlines of Pernstein. Veronica allowed me to treat her to a couple of drinks and a pack of cigarettes, but couldn't be convinced to take the private nighttime tour. As I stepped into the courtyard, I pulled out my phone to use as a flashlight while searching for the right key, when suddenly I had the feeling there was someone standing behind me. I turned around and there she was, leaning against the stone wall on the far side of the courtyard looking at me, her cream white dress was now torn in several places, and apart from the silent plea in her eyes, I also saw exhaustion. It was her, my castle ghost. I knew she meant me no harm. If she had wanted to hurt me, she would have done so a long time ago, so I viewed her without fear. Her cheeks were hollow, and she had circles underneath her sullen eyes. She looked worse than the first time I had encountered her in the mirror. As the wind blew tears into my eyes, I blinked, and when I opened my eyelids again, she was gone. The next morning I awoke to a beautiful sunny day. 
I found myself lying in bed half dressed with a bowl of salad drying out on the nightstand next to my bed. Apparently, I had forgotten to put it back in the fridge last night. Here we go, I thought. I'm going to rot alive here without any company. That afternoon, I took a walk around the castle. I wandered the castle halls, gazing at the paintings and taking in the silence. I didn't know what I was looking for until I found it an enormous canvas hanging in the place of honour in the dining room. That lovely face I knew so well with the penetrating green eyes. I stepped closer to study it. In her hand, the girl held a piece of fabric with an embroidered motif of some kind. By her side was a table with a pink cushion on it. Who is she, I wondered? The daughter of ancient rulers? Her to the castle? In the portrait next to hers was a man in armour. The two canvases, hanging side by side, left no doubt the man and woman belonged to each other. Was that her husband? Father? Brother? A thick moustache curled from under the knight's nose. His chin protruded slightly, giving him an air of nobility. There was a large scar on the right side of his face, running from his ear to the corner of his mouth. Probably a battle wound, I thought. Then I moved my eyes back to the girl. She stared confidently straight at the painter, but there was a look of quiet suffering in her gaze. Like a butterfly, whose wings had been clipped so they can no longer fly. I turned and walked quickly back toward the exit. Surely the tour narrations would contain a detailed biography of the people in the portraits. Ludmilla the First known as Ludmilla the Beautiful, was born in 1486. She was the sole heir of her generation in the most powerful family of Moravian nobles and owners of the Bernstein Castle, now known as Pernstein. At the age of 21, she married the knight Heinrich II from Boravia. Four years later, she disappeared without a trace under mysterious circumstances, and the castle land and property were all granted to Heinrich. Ever since then, the castle has been German. I read the short account over and over again. So her name was Ludmilla, and she had married Heinrich. She disappeared under mysterious circumstances at the age of 25. That was in 1511, which meant she died exactly, yes, 500 years ago. A hot wave came over me. Leaning back in my chair, I closed my eyes and tried to picture life in the dark Middle Ages. Horse hooves clattering across the smooth stones now covered by a layer of clay. Disease, poverty, violence. I wouldn't have wanted to live here centuries ago. History has never been too attractive to me. To tell the truth, it scares me. I'm convinced the present is the best time to be alive but there was no doubt that history had searched me out and now it was forcing me to enter. I spent the afternoon in the town library. I found the book of legends the historian had recommended and it was right there in the table of contents, The Mysterious Disappearance of Ludmilla I. I raced through the ten-page account holding my breath nearly all the way through. The author described Ludmilla as a sensible, strong-minded woman, an only child. Her parents had pushed her to marry, pressing her constantly. A strong husband would help protect the family property and firmly repel enemy attacks. Eventually they forced her to wed the Bavarian nobleman Heinrich II. But it wasn't a happy marriage. Legend has it that her husband beat and abused her. His behaviour only grew worse after the death of Ludmilla's parents, when she was 25. That was when she mysteriously disappeared. No one knows where she went. Perhaps on the brink of nervous exhaustion, she ran off with travelling gypsies. Perhaps she ended her miserable life by jumping from the castle tower. What actually happened to you, Ludmilla, 500 years ago? I knew I had to find an answer to my question. I sat in the cafe as my coffee went cold, keeping an eye out for Veronica. 
the day before, I had texted her that I would be here. But my wait was in vain. I snapped shut the book of Pernstein legends, paid the check and went back to the castle. One girl had blown me off, but I knew for sure the other one wouldn't leave me waiting. Ludmilla didn't disappoint, only this time it was different. She came to me in a dream. I was inside her body. It was the most awful nightmare I've ever had. I was tortured by three men. Two of them tied my hands behind my back and stuffed a dirty rag in my mouth so I couldn't scream. I had no idea who they were, but the third one I recognized. It was Heinrich II, the knight from the painting. He didn't have his armor on, but the mustache and his haughty look were a dead giveaway. We were in a dark room with water dripping down the walls. A jagged rock jutted out from one of the corners. Heinrich was pressing a bloody handkerchief to his right cheek. He held it away from his face a moment to check if he was still bleeding. He was. Bitch, he snarled at me, and I suddenly realized I was seeing the terrible scene through the eyes of the 25-year-old Ludd Miller. Look what you did to me kicked me in the stomach and an arrow of pain shot through my body, but I wasn't able to scream. I was just a mute witness trapped inside of Ludmilla's body. You'll pay for this. When I was finally released from my nightmare, I sat up, drenched in sweat, and looked around the room. It took a few seconds, then I realized I was not alone. She was standing on the far side of the room next to the door, pale and thin, her brown hair, so neatly brushed the last time I saw it, fell across her face in knotted clumps. This was our fourth meeting, and Lamilla looked worse and worse each time. Her body seemed to be dying, slowly yet steadily. What do you want from me? I summoned the courage to ask. She said nothing, just staring at me with a pleading look on her face. Tell me, how can I help you? There's no way for me to know. Ludmilla still refused to speak. Then suddenly her ghost began to dissolve, until it had disappeared completely. I shook like a poplar leaf in a strong wind, a disturbing, living dream, and a conversation with a girl who had been dead five hundred years. It was too much. I sat in the restaurant on the Nedvice town square, distractedly pushing the gravy around my plate with a dumpling. I wasn't sure I could bring myself to go back to Pernstein. The sign for the local hotel blinked at me from across the street. I wrestled with the temptation to stay there instead. I dialed Veronica's number again, reaching her voicemail for the fifteenth time. She was probably annoyed, but I really wasn't trying to get her in bed anymore, I just needed someone to listen to what had happened to me. I could have confided in the blank pages of a Word document, of course, or in any one of the people crossing the square, but I didn't think it would help. Honestly, I didn't think it would help for me to tell Veronica either. There was a voice in my head whispering that Ludmilla's ghost didn't want it. I was the only one she showed herself to, the only one who could help. She believed in me, and I couldn't let her down. I went back to the castle where my fifth night awaited me. I brewed myself some coffee in an effort to ward off the fatigue that I knew would come over me soon and opened the book of legends. As I read, I watched the courtyard darken outside the windows, waiting for sleep to carry me off to God only knew what the hell this time. I fell asleep in the armchair around midnight, spiralling down through time 500 years into the past, into Ludmilla's body condemned to death, a slow death. Whoever wants can take her one last time, Heinrich told his two henchmen, but watch out, the bitch's claws are sharp. He lifted his bloodied handkerchief from his cheek, then pressed it to the wound again. I proceeded to experience all the pain and humiliation Ludmilla felt as she was raped. Heinrich, leaning against the slanted stone wall, watched throughout with pleasure. How did you like it, filth? He said, standing over me when they were through. 
The nauseating smell of overripe cheeses filled my nose as the knight leaned forward and spat in my face. His companions lifted Ludmilla's body and stuffed it into a hole in the wall, too small even to sit in. The hard rock scraped against my back and knees. My eyes were closed, the lids crusted shut with tears, but for a split second I opened them and saw the men. They were piling stones on top of one another, sealing the cracks between them with sticky cement. A few minutes later, the last glint of light from the flickering torches struck my face, and then I was plunged into darkness. I awoke before dawn. They had walled her in. They had sealed Ludmilla inside the wall. Heinrich, her own husband, condemned her to this horrible death as soon as he got what he wanted. The castle, the property, and the pleasure of her pain and suffering. Where could the entrance to the castle cellar be? I didn't recall anyone ever mentioning one. I'll find you, Ludmilla, I whispered into the quiet of the night, and I'll make sure that you get the rest you deserve. I was interrupted from my thoughts by a draft of cold air. I looked around, for the first time in my life expecting to see a ghost, and yet what I saw terrified me. Ludmilla had changed beyond recognition. Head drooped, shoulders slumped, cheeks sunken. Her tired eyes stared glassily from the dark hollows of her eye sockets. A tattered rag was all that remained of her cream-white dress. The only thing still the same was the green emerald necklace around her neck. It flashed through my head that this was the fifth day she had appeared to me. The fifth day she had been walled inside her dark, coffin-like cell, five hundred years ago, dying a slow death. I got up and marched off to the castle. It was just getting light. No sooner had I stepped into the entrance hall than, to my astonishment, there it was, the door. I pushed aside the cabinet and the red upholstered armchair that had been blocking it and fished out my keys. The longest one in the set fit the lock and I swung open the door to reveal a staircase descending into darkness. Switching on my flashlight, I pointed the cone of light down the stairs. With one last look back, I secured the door with the armchair and set off to find Ludmilla. The stairs ended in a large room with stone walls and a rock jutting from the corner, just like my dream. Again, find Ludmilla. The stairs ended in a large room with stone walls and a rock jutting from the corner, just like in my dream. Here, directly across from where I stood, Heinrich had leaned against the wall, pressing the handkerchief to his face. I walked along the walls, running my fingers over the surface, rough and cool to the touch. Somewhere behind them, Ludmilla was waiting. Finally, I came across a spot the shape of a rectangle, where the stones weren't as carefully fitted together. There was no doubt... I had found Ludmilla's coffin. I raced up the stairs and bolted across the courtyard to the low roof shed where I knew the tools were kept. In there, amid the piles of junk, was a pickaxe. Downstairs, I set my flashlight on the earthen floor with the beam facing up, rear back, and struck the wall with all my might. A large piece cracked off at the level of my waist. I continued hacking away at the stone, sparks flying with each blow I landed. Before long, I had broken through to expose a small opening, the breath of the past wafting out of it, blowing onto me. I picked up my flashlight, poked my head in, and there it was at the bottom. A person's skeletal remains, covered in a layer of cloth as wispy as a spider web. I knew what colour it had been originally cream white. I stood on the doorstep of my house, watching as a dozen or so archaeologists scurried about like ants. 
talking with one another and into their phones, gesturing excitedly. The historian from the town office walked towards me with an awkward smile as, just behind him, two men loaded a black crate with Ludmilla's remains into a car park nearby. What you discovered in that basement changes the history of this place. They're going to have to rewrite the narrative for tours and... He drifted off, paused, then looked back at me with a serious face. You know, when you came here to Pernstein, I honestly didn't think you would last, let alone make a finding of such immense significance. I hope you won't leave. Why on earth would I do that, I asked. Oh, I don't know. A lot of people might be motivated to change their profession by finding a skeleton 500 years old. You mean not every Castellian expects to stumble onto a mystery from beyond the grave? So you aren't afraid to stay here, the historian asked. Of what? Ghosts. I shook my head. No, I'm not afraid of them anymore. Just one thing that surprised me, the historian said. How did you know the bones you discovered were the wife of Heinrich II? When you phoned, you didn't say you found a corpse. You said the corpse of Ludmilla the first. Ludmilla the beautiful. I shrugged. Intuition. After a moment of guilty silence, I added, and maybe the book of legends you recommended had something to do with it. There's a story in there about Ludmilla's disappearance. How did you verify it was her? I found this in her grave. The historian pulled out a folded photograph and I saw the necklace with the radiant green stone. It's an emerald, a gift from her parents they gave her when she turned 17. I see. How did you know where to look for her? I sensed a tone of suspicion in the historian's voice. He knew I was lying and was trying to figure out why. I was just walking through the cellar when I noticed some of the stones were different and this thought popped into my head about how being walled up was a common way that people were killed in the Middle Ages. After that, the fact that I found her was just a lucky coincidence. A lucky coincidence, the historian repeated. More than one, I'd say. He lingered a moment, then turned and walked off to his car. What's going to happen to her? I called out after him. Ludmilla will be buried in the local cemetery, Finally, her bones can rest in peace. I nodded. My job was done. I hoped the spirit of Ludmilla, a beautiful girl whose last years of life had been every bit as painful and mysterious as her death, would finally get some rest. She trusted me, and I had helped her. My heart flooded with warmth. I stayed up until 2am writing the first pages of my new novel. The story takes place in dark medieval times 500 years ago. In it, the hero exposes the master of the castle's cruel actions and sets out to punish him. Also, one of the characters will be a girl who... As I imagined the plot, I closed my eyes and let my thoughts flow freely. A short while later, my thoughts had changed to dreams. The next morning after breakfast, I decided to take a look in the cellar. I don't know why, maybe to spend a few quiet minutes in solitude where Ludmilla had spent five days dying all alone. Maybe to say goodbye to her one last time. And so I descended the stone stairs again. Again I searched out the dark opening with the cone of my flashlight and peered inside. The hole had been swept clean and the crumbled stone piled in the corner had been removed. Just as I turned to go back upstairs, I heard a muffled thud from above. With an awful premonition, I sprinted up the stairs to find the heavy oaken door shut. My mind raced as I realized I had forgotten to prop it open with the red upholstered chair. I swept the flashlight beam over the door where the handle should have been. Not there. I groaned in frustration. Alone in a castle atop a high rock where no one could hear me scream. I switched off my flashlight. The darkness was impenetrable. I switched it back on. How long would it last? Half a day? A day? How long would I last? Then it hit me. 
Five days, just like Ludmilla. Horror struck, I banged on the door as hard as I could, crying for help. My words echoed softly through the empty castle, but then I thought I heard a laugh on the other side of the door. Suddenly I snapped back to reality. A heavy door like that doesn't close on its own, and it wasn't a draft. Where would a draft come from in a cellar with no windows? And I hadn't forgotten to put the chair there. Somebody must have moved the chair and slammed the door shut. Somebody. I heard the laughter again. This time it was louder. As my nose tingled with the smell of overripe cheese, it suddenly dawned on me who that terrible cackle belonged to.